So yeah, this is Sex, Lies, and Data, which um, I've gotten some feedback is a little different. We're gonna start off uh, with these cases. These are true stories. And then we'll unpack some of the implications of what these stories offer. And then we're gonna have to go back a little bit in history, how we got here, and then how we're gonna move forward as a community. So our first story was with Facebook. We're all familiar? Got some head nods, yeah, okay. Um, so a few years ago, Facebook was doing something called A-B testing, and this is very normal. Websites engage in this all the time. Social media platforms do A-B testing. So what it is is that if you're group A, you would be group B, and I'm a website, and I would show you one version of my website, and I would show you another version of my website. And then I would track how you interact with this interface differently. You know, do I want to move this button over here? Do I want to change the color of the font? And how does that, how does that change user behavior with a, a website? A-B testing, totally normal, totally fine, legitimate. Facebook, uh, a few years ago, engaged in a particular kind of A-B testing that um, for group A, I would show you more positive posts and news stories in, in the emotional tenor of those posts, and I would show you more negative posts. And I wanted to see whether or not that changed the kinds of posts that you reciprocated in emotional tenor and content. And what they found is that, yes, it does. That if I, by showing you more positive posts, you guys are more likely to reciprocate that emotion back. And by showing you more negative posts, they reciprocated back more negative content. So they thought this was fascinating. They had a, a group of about 700,000 users that underwent this particular A-B testing, and they published on it in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. So you see on the left is the actual published paper. What you see on the right is an editorial expression of concern by the editors saying, hey, this seems a little fishy. Uh, we think that there's some things going on with informed consent here that could be problematic because the way that um, users engage in this, they weren't exactly aware that they were being shown a, a different feed, that they weren't in, you know, they didn't say, I'm, I'm signing up for A-B testing on uh, an emotional study. Um, this, this paper became known as the Emotional Contagion Paper. Um, has anybody heard of this or knew about this? Okay, several hands. Um, and so there was a lot of publicity. So when, you know, papers come out all the time, Several uh, get public notoriety when it, you know, it hits a nerve, and this one hit a nerve for people saying, you know, I, this, this feels different, this feels strange, I don't quite know why, but I don't like this. And so uh, a lot of press came out saying that this is maybe not how we want to do research, but um, nonetheless, this, uh, this came out in the proceedings, and this is a highly cited paper. Uh, it's only been out for a few years, but it's getting a lot of traction and attention. So that's story one. Story number two, OkCupid. Okay uh, if you're not familiar, this is a dating website. Um, you sign up, say, hi, my name is Shay. I, you know, I, I like cats and science fiction and cardigans. I'm a librarian from Denver. Uh, and then you would like swipe left, left, left or right on me, um, and you'd find a date. And um, some researchers thought this was a really interesting way to collect data, and so, what they did is they built something called a bot that uh, web scrapes. So they built a particular kind of bot that went into OkCupid and went page to page and you know collected Shea, Denver, Cardigans, Cats, Sci-Fi, um, and then sent all of that back to a database and um, were able to collect upwards of 70,000 user profiles and all the subsequent information and data within those profiles. So they published a paper, it's again on the left-hand side, that said this is the data that we collected, this is what we found, uh, and it's, it's up for everybody's use. And um, other researchers thought this is an amazing resource. Uh, anyone doing social science or psychology uh, can use something like this. And so the paper on the right is exploring, do we see certain per personality traits um, associated with media consumption and behavior. And they found out, yeah, certain personality traits as self-identified within their OkCupid profiles 
do have certain uh, behaviors of media consumption and preferences. But again, the users of OkCupid did not ever sign up to be a research participant in any paper or any study about media behavior. Uh, they didn't have any informed consent you know, papers that you normally check a box in. Um, and several people thought that this particular data set and this kind of pub uh, publication was problematic in a way that some other papers that are normally produced in our scholarly record aren't. So that's story number two. Story number three, Ashley Madison. If you're not familiar with Ashley Madison, it was, in the past tense, a website that was dedicated to facilitating extramarital affairs with discretion. So what you would do is if you were married and you wanted to have an affair, but you wanted to do it secretly, you would create a user account and say, this is my name, this is you know, where I live, here's my credit card account, this is kind of what I'm interested in, this is the frequency, duration, and content of what I would like to engage in, um, and is there anybody else out there that would like to participate? Also, one of the promises that Ashley Madison made its users, as part of the discretion area, is that if you ever delete your account, that we were going to make sure that all of your data is completely wiped from our databases, that we're very, very protective of your identity. Well, some online activists um, hacked into Ashley Madison and discovered that their promises of privacy and anonymity were actually not being kept. That any profile that was requested for deletion was actually still saved. And all of the measures of privacy and anonymity that they were um, saying that they underwent, they didn't. And this left those members very upset, and they said, uh, well, you're not following through on your promises to your users, and so we're going to actually publish all of your user data if you don't comply with the promises that you've said. And I think they gave them some period of time, I don't remember. Uh, Ashley Madison did not respond, did not comply, and when that time elapsed, every username, including name, location, uh, and all of your engagements in this website were made public. So everything that you had done on the website, uh, how often, with who, um, was recorded and made public. Needless to say, lots of marriages ended, lots of people lost their jobs, uh, and there were quite a few incidents reported of self-harm and suicide. So the social fallout of this kind of breach is qualitatively and quantitatively different and more severe than normal data breaches. Researchers looked at that data set and thought, man, that is really interesting and maybe I could use that as a source for a paper. Can I ask different kinds of questions with this now public data set? Uh, and so they went in and they, they looked at the data set. And uh, so the paper on the left is a paper from the University of um, Texas at Austin. A couple economists thought, is there a correlation between the way our personal ethics um, operate and our corporate ethics? And so because the, the data set was not anonymized, they could go in and find the identities of every person who was a CTO or a CIO of a publicly traded company. And then they asked, are CTOs and CIOs who have an Ashley Madison account, are they statistically more likely to be engaged in accusations of corporate misconduct from the Securities and Exchange Commission? And they found that yes, you are more than twice as likely to have accusations of misconduct or be engaged in a lawsuit if you have a profile. Now, if you have a profile, it doesn't mean you actually engaged in an extramarital affair, but it, it does mean it's more likely. And just because you have an allegation doesn't mean you engaged in misconduct, but it is more likely. Um, and so this is one kind of question that they were able to ask because this data set was made public. Other people came in and asked questions that were spatial related. Do we see you know, a, a distribution of more rural or more urban users? And yes, they, they do see uh, patterns emerge, you know, East Coast, West Coast regions. Um, they can associate that with job titles, um, with online user activity. Um, so nonetheless, 
yes, papers were published, and, and, and actually, for this case, I found it the most interesting. There, there wasn't as much pushback um, as to this feels different or this feels strange. Um, and um, the concerns that were raised here were, were much less loud than in the OKCupid okay study and in the Facebook study. Uh, and I posit that that we might feel a little bit less protective about this population because of the nature of the breach, that it came from a website that was dedicated to extramarital affairs. And we feel differently about that than we feel about Facebook or OKCupid. Okay That's my speculation, but nonetheless, I, I do think it's interesting that the, the pushback is not so much in this one, but are on, the, on the other two. So that is the end of the third story. So not, these stories didn't happen you know, back to back, but as I became aware of them, I noticed a very uh, distinct feeling that I had when I knew about them and, and understood what was happening, uh, and that they, they were creepy. They were very, very creepy. And I didn't have better language to come at this. Um, you know, ethical violations, sure, but like a very particular kind. This isn't like plagiarism. Um, you know, plagiarism is sucky and we don't like it, but this is different. Um, and, and why is it different? What, what's happening here that we think that this is uh, somehow something that we need to look at? Um, I kept coming back to, you know, shouldn't, shouldn't research have structures built into how it's produced that protect against things like this happening? And in fact, we do. Uh, we, we have lots of structures and a very formalized structure uh, for protection. And the analogy that, that sort of came to mind is a house. Like when we're building a house, when we're producing something, um, we need to actually have things that regulate it to make sure that it's safe, that it's inhabitable, um, that we can be protected as people uh, in this space and in the, the research space. So what, what are our structures for protection? Number one structure for protection that we're probably familiar with is an IRB or an Institutional Review Board. Uh, I remember the first time that I ever interacted with an IRB. I was a grad student trying to send a survey to other librarians. I was like, who are these people and why do they want to know about my survey, like this is like the lowest risk research in the history of research, uh, but they're making me fill out this crazy form and this arcane interface, and I don't get why this is happening. Uh, and I think for a lot of people, th if their first introduction is, you know, an IRB protocol without some context of what this is, uh, it can be problematic and really frustrating. I don't know of anyone that the IRB protocol is their favorite process of, of research. It's not why people go into to research is to fill these out. Um, and so I think it's, it's interesting to, to have a little bit of background as to why they're here and, and why it, um, they, this form exists and why this process exists. So it came out of something called the Tuskegee Syphilis Experiments. Um, is anybody here familiar with this or heard of this before? Okay. Oh, ah, more than I thought. Uh, this was a program that began in 1932 where the U.S. government knowingly infected rural poor African-American farmers with syphilis. Um, this was under the guise of providing free health care. Um, and this went on until 1972. So over the course of these decades, people that were given syphilis um, were never given any treatment, even after in the 40s when penicillin was discovered to actually be the most effective course of treatment. So uh, a lot of people died, a lot of people suffered, and when this came out as a result of a whistleblower, the, uh, the public were super angry, and as they should be, because this kind of thing is not something that we ever, ever want to happen again. And so uh, there was a lot of political pressure to do something about it, to create and codify um, norms of ethical research going forward. <coughs> so they created something called the Belmont Report. And this is sort of a seminal document that guides things that we take for granted now, such as informed consent and privacy. Um, those are conversations that took place that actually set the course of research uh, over the next 40 years. 
So after the Belmont report, certain things were created. Uh, so it's actually administered by the Department of Health and Human Services. We have a federal office of human research protection. And probably at every institution that you're associated with here, there's going to be an IRB and a research integrity officer that heads it up that makes sure that we're complying with these sort of ethical norms. So the Belmont report and the thing that's developed from it is it called the common rule. That's the thing that we go back to and, and use as a guiding document for how we're adjudicating decisions in IRB. That came out in 1974. If you don't remember 1974, if you weren't born yet, like this is The Godfather Part Two. The graphical user interface was just being rolled out on personal computers, which you might have known someone who knew someone who owned a personal computer. The way that research is being conducted at this point is still almost entirely paper-based. Um, and so when we're talking about uh, policies and procedures that govern how we're going into research, that's the framework, that's the setting. Um, over the course of the next um, 10, 20 years, personal computers uh, become far more common and are uh, starting to be integrated. Mainframe computers are actually already in universities at this point, but you know they're, they're getting smaller, they're becoming a little bit more normal. And so uh, they realized that we, we should probably update the common rule. And so the next iteration of the common rule is in 1991. And this gem with Patrick Swayze and Connor Reeves comes out point break. Uh, personal computers are, you, you probably know someone or own one. Maybe not in your house, but you have access to one. Uh, they're, they're, they're more common in research settings. Um, this is also when Tim Berners-Lee, when he was working at CERN, releases the World Wide Web to, be, to users outside of CERN. So the internet already exists, but the web rolls out. And there's things like email. And there's things like Mosaic and web browsers. Uh, and you'll, you'll notice a, a trend that as soon as a common rule is updated, some new technology comes out that sort of changes everything. Uh, and in this case, the web makes the internet usable and participatory um, in a way that we hadn't seen before. And, and the web and the internet become integral into how we're producing research and changes the kinds of questions that we can ask. <coughs> the next iteration comes out in 2006. Deborah Wars Prada, Meryl Streep, Anne Hathaway. This is also when Twitter launches. The first tweet comes out in the summer of 2006. Facebook's already been around a little bit. MySpace has about 100,000 users. Social media starts to dominate one of the main forms of communication online. And all of a sudden, social media, social media research becomes a thing that you can do. And the data that's produced by those social networks and network theory and network information um, become fields um, that maybe not dominate, but that are nonetheless very active and robust. So again, update, social media comes and changes a little bit of how we do research. The next iteration we just had, this came out in January. In figures, if you haven't seen it, go see it. It's amazing. Um, Unfortunately, this last update has not been able to address almost anything that I'm talking about. The three cases that we, we went over with Facebook, OkCupid, and Ashley Madison are not addressed in, in the common rule and how to adjudicate those kinds of decisions. So one of the things that I'm driving at is, is that the average response time of the common rule, if for those keeping score, is 14 and a half years. So we can anticipate the next common rule to come out in 2031. Um, Vin Diesel will be turning 65 uh, in 2031. It'll be a big year for him. Um, so ultimately, the way that we're structuring and updating our ethical framework for how we're engaging in research is really slow. And we have some built-in dysfunctionality. There's some design problems in the things that are supposed to be guiding the way is that they're lagging behind the tools and the landscape in which we're doing research. And that's problematic. 
So um, <coughs> there's another form of research that I, I find really interesting that is also not addressed in anything that the common rule would spell out. And uh, that is called algorithmic discrimination. Just to kind of get a feel, has anyone heard of algorithmic discrimination or, or know what it might be? OK, that's OK if you don't. Um, it's almost easier to show what it is. Um, so I'm going to show you some examples that um, you might have seen before. This is a Google image search for doctor. You will see mostly white men. This is a Google image search for secretary, largely women of color. The next one I'm going to show you is a comparison side by side of image search results. And the search terms are three black teenagers and three white teenagers. What you see on the left are actually mug shots. And what you see on the right are teens with sports equipment or having fun or smiling. This one uh, costs Google a lot of public pressure. Um, there's a really amazing researcher, Sophia Noble from UCLA, who does uh, algorithmic discrimination work that I love and talks a lot about this. Um, so to me, this, this is beyond creepy. Um, we left creepy behind, and this is actually discriminatory. Um, this is per pervasive and systematic oppression. Um, and so this is one field of research uh, that has fallen into uh, some trouble. There are some researchers that actually like to do algorithmic auditing. And one of the ways that they audit algorithms is they actually have to break terms of service. So there's a case of, you know, this is a, a screenshot of Redfin. If you haven't used that, there's also Zillow is another popular one. But it shows um, housing listings to people through a web browser. But the, the researchers who were looking into algorithmic discrimination found that Redfin and Zillow and websites like it often showed higher priced homes to white people and lower priced homes to African American. Um, very similar findings when they looked into uh, job aggregators like Indeed, that men were often showed higher paying salaries than women. But again, in order to be able to do this kind of research, they had to break terms of service. So when you click on a website, you agree to operate by its terms of service. And they, they actively violated the terms of service. And there is currently a rule on the books that classifies that as online uh, piracy and is illegal. And they're currently being um, sued, and they're countersuing um, for this online piracy violation. So they're literally breaking the law in order to engage in their research. And they have to break the law because the law is designed to protect the website and companies that operate things like Redfin and Zillow. Under the common rule as it stands, this would never pass IRB because they're actually dealing with humans. Like these are users. They actually have, they have to go through IRB. But IRB can't ever pass a study that actively and knowingly breaks the law. So we have a problem here. We have something that we can all agree is horrifying and shouldn't happen. But if we want to shine light on it and say this is happening, uh, we can't because we can't go through IRB and we can't break the law. So there's, there's two conclusions that I arrive at when I'm thinking through this, is that sometimes the wrong thing to do may be allowed. And that is the case now. When we're engaging in research, when we're helping researchers or our institutions, when we're trying to support it, the current structures of authority that say what is and isn't OK in research are going to allow things that I don't think are OK. And so that can't be the only guiding principle or um, structure that we think through things uh, when, we're, when we're approaching research questions. And then the second thing is that sometimes the right thing to do might be against the rules. So this falls under the algorithmic discrimination, breaking terms of service. I strongly believe that that is research that needs to be done. 
it is currently against the law and therefore currently against IRB and common rule rules. So thinking back to the house metaphor that we, we've created this research space that we're trying to build in structures of protection, um, I don't think that the answer is to, to just burn it down. Like screw it, like this is obviously not working, we have to scrap it and start over. Like that's not what I'm hoping you take away from this, that's policy vigilantism. Uh, I think what we need to do is actually a little bit harder and that's policy reform. And if you've ever done any sort of renovation, it totally sucks. It takes a long time, it's probably expensive, and it's not fun. But I actually think it's worth it. I think the, the research endeavor is important enough that it, it takes that time and effort and, it, and it's worth doing it. <coughs> so I think there's some ground rules going forward. If we are going to, to do um, policy reform, if we're going to engage in questions that we don't have any sort of guiding documents are, we need to have at least some principles um, that can help us think through these issues. And so um, they're listed on the paper uh, on the top, but we're going to go through one by one and kind of unpack a little bit of what they mean. So the first one is that silence does not equal consent. Um, in the first two rules, Especially, I think there's a really strong parallel between sexual ethics and research ethics. So silence does not equal consent. If you've been following sexual education recently, uh, consent has been a very big topic. That consent is affirmative, it is spoken, it is not ever inferred, and consent can be revoked at any time. Revocable consent is not a concept that we actively operate in in research ethics. There is no unconsent button in a, in a research study design that we can ever point to. Sage Bio Networks is a uh, company, and actually a nonprofit, I think, that does some really interesting work on informed consent. They've got a consent toolkit that I think is excellent. Um, and they're sort of working on an unconsent idea to how to systematically put unconsent. Uh, in the research process, but that's not something I've ever seen in the study design. So when it comes to silence, um, the silence of Facebook users, OkCupid users, Ashley Madison users, uh, that was always interpreted as it's okay. They're not saying anything, and so we can go and use it. But we, we can't ever assume that silence is an agreement or consensuality of the participants moving forward. <laughs> Number two is online availability does not make something public. So for this one, getting more uncomfortable, um, I think this is a, a strong parallel to something called revenge porn. If you're not familiar with what revenge porn is, it's when in a trusting relationship, when two people or more, we'll be inclusive, engage in behavior where they record each other or themselves, in sexual activity, and in violation of that trust, one member posts very publicly that recording. Um, it's usually done in a way that is shaming and retaliatory, um, and it's then publicly consumed. For OkCupid, for uh, Facebook, and especially for Ashley Madison, this is the research equivalent of revenge porn. Um, the trust of the users were violated, the data was made public without consent, and oftentimes there's ridicule that's associated with the information that's gathered. Um, I also think in both cases, in research ethics and sexual ethics, there is an often a, a public response of victim blaming that we shouldn't be stupid enough to put anything online that we're not totally comfortable with. And that's the, that's the response that is it's on the, the fault of the person who made the video or the person who gave their data to Ashley Madison or to Facebook, that they should just have better you know, street smarts or credibility or digital literacy if you're a librarian. That's how you'd critique it. Um, I, however, feel very strongly that the violation um, 
is on the person who broke the trust. And it's not on the partner who took the video, it's on the partner that posted the video. It's not on the participant who, participant who gave the data to the website, it's the website's responsibility to protect privacy. That's where the wrong happens and that's where I think um, we should be addressing our focus, not on the people who participated. So moving forward as researchers, what I think we need to do is actually not participate um, in any data that was done without consent. So the people that view revenge porn are in a way complicit in its creation by its consumption. I believe that the researchers who use data that was taken without consent are complicit in that violation. So the published papers that came from the Ashley Madison hack are participating in the hack by using it. I think that that is where we need to draw a line is that the intention of how the data was produced has to be taken into account. And if the users never intended to have their data be turned into a paper, we shouldn't be turning it into a paper. Um, it gets complicated. Data reuse is something that I love. Like I, I'm an advocate for open data and open science. Um, and I think data reuse is really important to ask different kinds of questions. But if we're actively violating the intention of the people who gave it, we're engaging in something that is really problematic and I think unethical. Again, I don't have all of the answers of how to do that, but nonetheless, I think this is, a, again, a, a guiding principle, a ground rule. <coughs> all right, number three, tools are not neutral. The easiest one to point to on this is algorithms. That's a tool. But even the software packages that we're using to analyze data were designed with particular uses in mind. And so when we take them to a data set, we're going to have uh, presuppositions that are imbued into the data that will color our results. And then very tightly coupled to this is that data are not neutral or data is not neutral. I don't feel strongly about either. Um, and this is when I get pushback sometimes from people when I, when I say this. Um, because data is supposed to be a objective measure of the world. Data is as non-political as you can get, it's just data. Um, but it's not just data. Data is not a uh, metaphysical window into reality. Data is a subjective encapsulation of a certain observation. Um, which again, it, it butts up against some assumptions of how science and research are conducted, um, which we'll unpack a little bit in number six. All right, number five. Ethics are complex and intersectional. <coughs> ethics are so hard. Uh, applied ethics is, is hard. Um, and by intersectional, I'm borrowing a phrase, intersectionality and critical race theory. Um, it's the idea that our identities are not hierarchical. So my whiteness, my maleness, my heterosexuality, my cisgenderedness, they're not, one is more foundational than the other, that they're overlapping and they intersect and you have to take account to all of them in order to get a, a full picture of who I am. Similarly, systems of oppression and discrimination are intersectional. There's not one that is more dominant than the other in order to understand the entire picture of structures of discrimination and oppression, you have to have an intersectional approach. And we need to have an ethic that guides research that can understand intersectionality and be able to speak to every level of that structure of ourselves and in the structures in the world in order to be able to navigate these really complex ideas and really complex situations so we can start producing research that we can stand behind. All right, number six, our ontologies and epistemologies are suspect. I'm using the word ontology here in not the librarian sense of ontology. Uh, I'm using it largely in philosophical terms, and these are not things that are typically brought up in like a research data management consultation. Mm -hmm. um, and that's okay, like I'm not saying they should be, um, but they need to be brought up sometime. And uh, so let's unpack the words. Ontology is a structure of reality, a hierarchy of being, a way of existing. Um, Again, not things that are typically introduced into a study design, but are very, very present. So let's, let's take the first one. Again, not the same 
as a taxonomy, but I'm using a, a taxonomy as a metaphor here. We look at this and we say, yes, this is a window of reality. This is how we can organize. Uh, this is actually, I think, a microbiome, different relationships of uh, microbes uh, and how they relate to one another. It's an organization of reality that we've imbued. And we can say that this is accurate and represents something that exists in the world. Um, and most people would look at this and say, you know, they might critique this tree versus that tree. But nonetheless, oh, this is a way of organizing knowledge and understanding that's used all the time. It's an ontology. This is also an ontology. This is a hierarchy of race as science, in air quotes, understood it 70 years ago. They were bringing an ontology to the world, but they didn't see it as them bringing an ontology to the world. This is how they saw the world organizing itself, and then they tried to represent it in the same way that we think that we are bringing this organization to the world and representing it as it is. However, this is, this is us bringing something to the world, not the world telling us something about itself. This ontology says way more about the researchers that created it than it says about the world. So our ontologies are suspect. Okay, epistemology. Is you sticking with me? I know this is kind of heavy stuff. Sorry. Uh, I'm actually not sorry. So epistemologies. How do we know that we know? What are the ways in which we um, can say that we know something? True justified belief is one definition. Also problematic. Um, but let's be honest. We say that we know things when we can measure something. Um, typically quantitative. We have a quantitative bias in, in measurement. If it's quantitative versus qualitative, we might say it, it's more trustworthy. We typically like things that we can graph. This is like, this makes us feel good. In my li librarian heart, I'm like, yes, OK, this is probably more solid if it's graphed, if there's numbers behind it. This is also a um, normal distribution of IQs. And the way in which we measured IQs looked like this at one point. This is a photo from the early 1900s stemming from a study with the United States Army funded by a popular eugenics movement in the United States. What they wanted to do is measure IQ. The, the test that they actually created measured cultural literacy for whiteness. And not just any whiteness, typically middle class affluent whiteness. And so when they give these tests to a rural farmer who's African American, they can prove that this African American man is two standard deviations dumber in IQ than the average white man. And they, this, is, this is, in their mind, they're measuring something that's in the world. They're using the given methodologies that their science had at the time, um, but they were bringing so much to the table and there was no value system to interrogate uh, those ideas to check that maybe this is problematic. And yet we now say, oh my god, this is horrifying. Uh, and of course, this is bogus science. But no one at the time had anything that could do the same checks then. And I strongly believe that in 70 years from now, they're going to think on us today, oh my god, this is horrifying. Why didn't they interrogate the values and the assumptions that they brought to their science? And we have an opportunity now to say, OK, let's, let's do that. Let's try to figure out what our blind spots are. What, are we, what ontologies and epistemologies are we bringing to the table? And what are we participating as a scientific and research enterprise in which we're all involved in? What are we supporting and propping up that we actually, if called out, would find problematic? <coughs> all right, so this is a big takeaway. Values are built into all research. And by in your whatever role you are, you're supporting the research. You're also supporting the values. The answer isn't to say, let's just take out the values. Let's just make it neutral. Let's make it about the science. 
Um, that's actually impossible. The way human beings are wired, we cannot disentangle our subjectivity. We cannot disentangle our values, uh, even if we wanted to. And I'm not even convinced that we want to. So we have to accept as a given that we're building values into research, no matter what. And so the result is that if we can't get rid of it, how do we build into our research something that is going to interrogate and explicate those values? And so what I have in front of you, those, those handouts, are literally just like a, a first pitch. Would these kinds of questions, if introduced into the research at any point, would they get at some of these values? If that piece of paper was given to some of these studies uh, that we've talked about, would that change any of the conversation? And maybe it wouldn't have. Maybe this isn't the, the right <coughs> direction to take. And this is also why I really, really want feedback from you. Um, how do we go about interrogating the values that are built into research? So um, that's, that's sort of the, the, the talking part of sex, lies, and data. I'd love to actually start having a dialogue with you. Um, I think these slides are going to be available online. Um, so there's links and uh, citations for all the articles and documents I mentioned, uh, a crap ton of image credits, um, some recommended further readings. So um, Dana Boyd, Sophia Noble, and Anna Lauren Hoffman are all amazing. Uh, please check them out for, uh, for further reading. Uh, and then there's my contact information. Um, so yeah, I, I want to open this up for questions, but I really do want to have this be a dialogue of how would you go about doing this? I know that uh, I'm currently working with IRB at uh, a couple institutions. My library serves three institutions. And so um, they're interested in these kinds of conversations. I've actually been really surprised um, but they, they want to have these conversations. They're not sure yet either how to have them. How do we approach researchers and sort of do education? Uh, do we call it education? How do we even frame this kind of discussion? Can we build policy around this? Uh, a lot of these questions are not standard questions, like what feelings does this study evoke from you? We have to talk about feelings. Like, no one wants to do that. This is not what librarians do or what IRB does. And yet, I think talking about our feelings is going to be really important when we're dealing with complex intersectional ethical issues with humans. Um, so, I'll stop it there. Uh, so, thank you very much.